church and welcome. We are back online for the moment, a decision which wasn't taken lightly, but a decision that was taken to protect as many people as we can from what is happening at the moment in the country with the third wave. Um, as soon as we can, and as soon as is wise, we will definitely back, be back on site. Um, and all of the communication for this will mostly be through our WhatsApp groups. 
And so if you're not on a WhatsApp group, please contact Nolene or any one of the pastors to be put onto one of those groups. Uh, all the notifications go out on there. Um, we are praying for those who are feeling ill. We're praying for those who are feeling sick. And we're praying for those of you who aren't. We want you to be safe. So please be safe. But we are so glad that we can still, in this way, gather together and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we sing songs in our homes, as we listen to the word being preached in our home, we are a part of something so much bigger than just what is happening in our immediate vicinity. God is working and God is still doing incredible things. And we're trusting in him through this process and through what is happening. We also ask you to pray with us. Uh, we want God's wisdom and his insight in how to move forward through this time. Um, and we just want him to guide us by his Holy Spirit. And so now as we spend some time together as a church in the new territory, let us praise his name because he deserves it.
walking around these walls. I thought by now they fall, but you have never failed me.
Greetings everybody. Um, I'm not sure when you're going to be watching this particular stream, if it's going to be in the morning or in the afternoon or during the day on Sunday, or whether it is even in the evening that you'll be watching this. But um, I know that we're living in weird times. I, didn't, I really didn't think that I would be recording like this again in terms of sermons, that we would be able to do them in the church and in the building with all the staff at the moment. I'm sitting here next to near the kitchen and I'm the only person on site and the building is completely quiet and um, it just seems so wrong. But at the same time, we I was just so aware that God is working. And um, I was reminded of this over the weekend, actually, this past weekend, where um, I was sitting with my family, with um, Heidi and Kate and obviously Christopher is in the UK, and we were sitting and we were looking over a massive rock pool where and the tide was starting to come in and was starting to break over into the pool and, and starting to clean the pool, so to speak. And it reminded me of years back um, when I was growing up in a little place, um, we used to holiday, in a little place called Kids Beach. Some of you will know it if you know the Eastern Cape. And in front of our house was a tidal pool. And I can remember that tidal pool and I was just expressing this to my family over the weekend and to and saying to them, look, you know, what ha used to happen was uh, that pool would fill up on a very high tide. And, um, in the, and up until that point, when the tide was low, and for days and sometimes weeks, um, people would swim in that pool. And, and you know, when it comes to the sea pools and rock pools, people wee in the water and um, babies are in there. You don't know what is happening in the water. And the water would just get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. And um, if you were to walk in there, you would start feeling the sludge on the bottom of, of the pool. And then all of a sudden, um, out of nowhere, the tide would come in again. And obviously it would be anticipated um, that this would happen. And then it would spill over into the tidal pool and it would clean and wash that pool out so beautifully. And uh, even though up until that point everything was dead and dying, uh, this new fresh wave of water would come into the pool and clean it out and bring new life and freshness out of that. And as I was thinking about it, I was thinking actually that this is something of what we are going through. And I, I, I thought of, of this being the third wave of Corona. We, we anticipate um, that Many are still getting sick around the country, but what about the wave of God's Spirit? And what about the new things that He's doing? And if we would open our hearts to Him through this time and learn the things that He really wants us to learn, I mean, how different would it be that, that we could see His work in us and in our lives? And when we think and speak about um, the new territory, which has been our theme um, for the last little while in our sermons, we think about a new wave of God's Spirit, and it wasn't um, new in the sense of uh, something completely different that had been anticipated in the book of Joel, that God would pour out His Spirit on all people, that you and I would have this daily empowering, this daily dependence that we could have on the, the Spirit of God, and we see this empowering happening to the early church and to the disciples, and something incredibly significant happens. Change begins to happen in their hearts as individuals, but also in that community. And we see something of that in this particular passage that we are going to read um, this morning. And if you have your Bibles, um, um, please open up at Acts chapter 4. If you don't have your Bible, please go and quickly get one and so that you can follow along as well. And if you can keep your Bible open in front of you, remember this is God's Word to us. And it's precious, and and um, I want to just uh, read from His Word now in Acts chapter four and verse thirty-two to verse thirty-seven. It's the follow-on of what we've been going through, and it says, and it's titled, "They had everything in common." Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said of any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They were preaching the gospel, in other words. They were telling people about 
The change that had happened in their lives, their testimony as a result of Jesus and as a result of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And great grace was on them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many were owners of lands and houses, or houses, sold them and bought the proceeds of what had been sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everyone as they had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called the apostle by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Really, the, the central thought of what I want you to grasp out of this is as believers and as followers of Jesus Christ, and especially in a time like we've been going through, is to learn to live with a soft heart and with open hands. Learn to live with a compassionate heart and with open hands. Or the other way, open hands and a compassionate soft heart. One that is very uh, willing and sensitive to what the Spirit of God is saying and what the Spirit of God is doing um, in our midst. I think we're all aware of, of the little um, phrase because it's really part of life and part of what we go through and experience um, every day and that's the little phrase, um, it's so unfair. If you have had children in your home or if you've got friends who've got children and they've been around and one child gets a a biscuit or one child gets something that the other child wants and wouldn't get any of that themselves, we often hear children say, that's not fair. That's not fair. I want what she has got. I want what he has got. And uh, that goes into all kinds of different areas of life, whether it is discipline where we've disciplined the one child in one way and the other child sees that they've been disciplined differently and they say, that's not fair. And uh, we, we recognize that this is not just amongst children. This is something that really influences and affects all of life, really. And we all know and have experienced those moments when we just feel that something um, is not fair. We often think of some people who are almost born with a silver spoon in their mouths and, and everything comes easy to them. And I don't know if you've experienced that, where that has happened with somebody um, they have sporting talents, they have sporting gifts, they just pick up a, a tennis racket and they can play a game of tennis without having to be coached or without having to practice. They can pick up a rugby ball and they can play any position on the field. Um, they can pick up a cricket ball and bowl somebody out or even the bat and, and bat so well. And, and you have to practice and practice and practice and you have to try and get better and better and better. But, but when it comes to the match, they still do better than what you do. And, and in those moments, we also think, well, that's not fair. Life is not fair, and this is not fair. And uh, we see it in all kinds of circumstances. We see it in times of trouble. And even through this time of corona, there have been those individuals who I know across the country who, who just seem to have had it worse than anybody else. And whilst one person in this family gets sick, in that particular family, everyone gets sick and one or two people have passed away and, and it's so easy to look and just to say, that's not fair. Or we can look and drive along the end too and, and we can think to, to ourselves that as we look at the homes and as we look at the poverty and as we look at the discrepancy between rich and poor and those who have and those who don't have and, and in those moments of sensitivity to what God is saying to us and speaking into our lives and into our hearts, we can also feel and think, well, you know, that's not fair. Why do some have everything and others have so little? And why do some have to struggle so whilst others don't? Well, in this, it's also, we're also very tempted to, to feel and to think that in all of this, you know, God doesn't know and God doesn't care. And the reality is God does know and God does care. I can remember just in a simple little illustration, just a beautiful illustration of, from our own family and under those no circumstances must you, must you feel that um, I'm saying to you that we're in need as a family. That's not the case. There were times in our lives when it was difficult and especially when I was a youth pastor up in Pretoria and we just had our children, times were tough and times were difficult. And, 
And it's not necessarily easy now, but it's, it's so much better. But I can remember with our own children when they would experience this, where as a pastor's kid, I would say, you know, look, we can't do this. We can't give you this phone. Or we, we have to take these hand-me-downs from this family. And we can't go and buy that particular item of clothing that you are wanting. But, but you have been given so many beautiful clothes. And, and I can remember saying to them, you know, God has a way of caring for those who are His. And I can remember one of the things that I said to them was, as a pastor's kid, sometimes you have privileges that no other children have. And, and no sooner as I'd said that to them, that Uncle Jack, and many of you will remember him as an elderly man in the congregation, just a godly man, and he would do something during the year. He would put all his two rand and five rand coins in a bottle. And by the end of the year, it would be a big bottle of coins, of five rands and two rands and one rand coins. And then he would present that to our children um, once a year to, to take and to divide it amongst themselves. And they, they had this as PKs in this church, and they would, they would experience something different of God's economy and, and something different of God's way. But not only that, in terms of experientially, but we know that the Bible is just so clear and so... Uh, it emphasizes so much the, the heart that God has and for the poor. We can go to the New Testament, but we can even go back to the Old Testament. We can see so many things that, that God, and I'm just going to put up a, uh, a lot of verses now that you can just look at on the screen that, that you will see some of these places where God is spoken of and His care. And we say, where is God in this? And, and we know that the world has gone wrong and we know that there are so many things that aren't right in this world. But you don't have to look at the Bible alone to realize that that God is a God who cares for the poor. And God is a God who is deeply concerned about justice. And deeply, deeply concerned where those are who have are oppressing those who don't have. And the Bible is just full of examples over and over and over of examples of the heart that God has for the poor. He has, the, he has a heart for the oppressed. He has a heart for those who have very little. In actual fact, sometimes he says, you know, when, when we give to the poor, when we are kind to the poor, we are, we are lending to God. It's, it's as if we are doing something for God when we have a heart that is, is open, a heart that is soft, a heart that is compassionate towards the poor, and hands that are, are quick to help, and who are, are sensitive to the spontaneous work of God's Spirit that is happening in the moment and and over a continual and over a period of time. And so we realize that God is deeply concerned for justice and for the poor. He's deeply concerned when in a church there is partiality towards those who are rich, where special privileges are given to the rich and those who are poor are kind of cast aside and not given the same level of care and attention that those who have money are given. He's very uh, concerned about providing for the poor and the kindness that we may show. And in actual fact, there's one passage that you'll see on the screen alongside me, and that is that tells us that our prayers are hindered when we um, do not have a heart that is open towards the poor. In actual fact, Isaiah 58 is just one of the most challenging chapters in the Bible because it, it just says, you know, your worship is useless. My worship is useless. And has no value to God whatsoever if I do not have a heart for the poor. If I don't see the need around me and what God has given me and what He has done for me and how He has uh, blessed me in so many different ways financially and with gifts and with all the stuff that I have. If I don't have a heart that is open and a heart that is sensitive and a heart that is soft and a heart that is compassionate towards the poor and hands that are open towards those who have need then my prayers aren't and won't be answered. Well, that's just the Old Testament. And if you read those passages, there are so many more that I didn't put down there that you can go and read yourself and find out a little bit more. But, but what has happened in this passage of Scripture? If we go back to the passage of Scripture, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with the resurrection of the Lord and, and, and with the great power of the apostles were giving their testimony 
to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many were owners of lands and houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was called and distributed to each as they had need. And thus Joseph, who was also called the apostle, by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, that was his nickname given by the apostles. They saw in this man just a heart of, of encouragement. And the, Barnabas now goes and a Levite and a native of Cyprus and sells a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now I know many of you are probably saying, Ananias and Sapphira, what about Ananias and Sapphira? And I'll mention um, Ananias and Sapphira at the end of this message because it does form part of this whole narrative of what is actually happening here. But what has happened? The church has been born. God has, has come into people's lives and has been that new wave that has flown over into the religious times and the religious um, um, mire of the day and the dirt of the day and God is doing a new thing. He's establishing a new territory. He's brought his kingdom to earth and now people are coming into his kingdom and coming into his family. And the first thing that happens is that the church was united. All who believed were one in heart and soul. Now this is not just unity for the sake of speaking unity because sometimes we, we know that unity can be have this double-edged sword where you know sometimes we recall on to have unity with individuals who are just so different in theological understanding to what we are and there's stuff in theology that we can't accept and, and but this is something that's so much deeper this is about a heart unity that has happened where i look at my brothers and my sisters in christ and i recognize and I deeply recognize that they are my family. That in this church, at Durbanville Baptist Church, I have brothers and I have sisters in the Lord. That I have mothers and I have fathers in the Lord. That I have grandparents in the Lord. And that we have become one in terms of the unity that Christ has brought for us on the cross of Calvary. And so when you're in pain and when you're struggling, then that touches on my life because as a family member of yours, I need to see what it is that I can do to help you and how I can stand alongside of you in your time of need. And I know that we have to do this with great wisdom because I know that a system like this is always open to abuse, but I, I don't want to speak about that this morning. I want to just, uh, today, I just want to say to you that, that you need to recognize others in this body as brothers and sisters in the Lord and and not see yourself as isolated, an isolated island who, who needs to kind of keep yourself sanitized from all the people around you because they you know, have all these issues and if you get involved, then you get involved in their issues as well and it becomes complicated and messy and all the rest that, that happens. But that where I can genuinely see you as my brother or my sister, as my father, my mother, um, or my grandparents, or my grandmother, or grandfather, and and I can see that, and and in the ways that God has gifted me, in the ways that God has empowered me, the way He has provided for me, and I can use what God has given me to bless you and to bless others around me. We also see that the church lived with open hands and with a compassionate heart. They recognized, perhaps for the very, very first time, and maybe today this is something that you need to recognize just for the very, very first time in your life. They recognized that God had given them stuff in this life to steward for His glory and for His honor. You see, there's a very big difference between stewarding what God has given you, taking care of what God has given you, and be open to what God is saying to you to do with what He has given you, and feeling as though that you're the owner. There's a very big difference between stewardship and ownership. I know that what God has given me doesn't belong to me ultimately, and that it belongs to Him, and that literally He can take it away in a minute. That He can take it all away in moments that you know, a fire could break out, and our house could burn down, or the investments that we have made could be um, something could happen where somebody steals those investments and, and, 
And that doesn't you know, put, um, drive fear into my heart, but it drives an understanding that what we have in this world is temporary, and what God has given us, I'm a steward of that. Yes, I must care for my family. Yes, I must care for those that love me. And, and, and yes, I must um, take the responsibility and, and, and be a good steward of what God has done for me. But that I can live at the same time with an open hand, with open hands, and with compassionate hearts. Sometimes we live with closed hands. And I want to say to you that there are some great temptations that I want to say to you, be careful of. One of the temptations that many uh, make and, go, and fall into is they say, you know, when I have enough, I will then become generous. The reality is, is that you have to be generous with what you have now. And you have to be generous like the widow who is, goes and who puts her coin in the offering in the temple and, and Jesus commends her because she is given out of her poverty and she's given from what she doesn't have, whilst others give from what they do have. I want to say to you, be careful of the temptation as God blesses you, as God provides for you, as He financially things start to come right for you and things start you know, lining up for you. Be careful of, of closing your hands on the needs of those around you. It's the strangest thing that often happens is that wealth is, can become so possessive of our souls, that wealth can become so dominating in our lives, that those things that we have can become so entrapping um, and can become so, so much of a bondage in our lives that, that even though we are getting more, that we become more and more stingy with what we have. And it takes an incredible work of God's Spirit to pry open our hands to see that, yes, we can also be generous and that we can also be um, people who can have open hands and, and a soft heart. And I want to say to you, I want to encourage you this morning, that is what is in, on God's heart. His heart is for the poor. His heart is for justice. In actual fact, that beautiful verse of Scripture that reminds us, you know, what is it that the Lord requires of you? He, he asks you to to act justly, to um, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Included in that is just an understanding of the fact that God has given you so much, that God has enabled you to act justly towards people around you, and to have mercy towards those around you, and to walk humbly with your God. Also, I want you to be aware of the temptation to think that now that you have, that you're better than anybody else. That you have it all together, that you, your success puts you a little bit of a, on a run above. Now I know in parts of the world our class systems, the class systems that are out there, have kind of encouraged us to, for people to see themselves as better than or to see in a class above others. What happens in this passage is we recognize soon um, after this passage is written, that, that there are going to be disciples coming in, there are going to be followers of Jesus coming in from all over the place. There are going to be those who are previously slaves, who have very little in this life, who are going to come into the faith and who are going to now become followers of Jesus. There are those who are going to be wealthy landowners who are going to come to faith. Their hearts will be cut and they will be drawn to Jesus and drawn to God and they will be, be brought into the kingdom of God and and. And there will be those who are old and those that are young and there will be this diversity of people coming into the kingdom of God and some will have and some won't have. And this passage is just a beautiful example of how God wants us to be sensitive to what the Spirit of God is doing in the moment where we can have open hands and soft hearts and compassionate hearts towards those around us. Well, the third thought I want to share with you is that the church's unity led to reckless generosity. Now, I say reckless with inverted commas because it's not really reckless, but I'll explain it in a moment. We, we know that this church, this early church, the Jerusalem church would receive from the Macedonian churches at a later stage, 
gifts and offerings because the Jerusalem church would go through a time of struggle and difficulty and, and the Macedonian churches would be approached to help and they in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is just a, a magnificent passage of scripture that reminds us that here was a church who, who out of their poverty gave they didn't have all of the finances. They saw a need and they said, Lord, this is something that your spirit is leading us to do. We're going to give to that need. They gave out of their poverty, the Bible says. They gave what they were able and even beyond what they were able. We know that this seems so reckless. Barnabas going and selling a field and giving it and putting it at the disciples' feet or at the apostles' feet and, and having that then this, the money distributed. We, we see this very often as such a reckless act. And perhaps in today's world, that's not what God is calling you to do. But, but I want to say to you, sometimes the Spirit of God leads in such a way that what seems reckless to those around us is the very thing that God calls on us and calls on you to do. What may seem like an outrageous act, an irresponsible act, where God's Spirit has moved and worked and He has led you into this moment where you have to give something that God is telling you to give, that you may see that as reckless. But in reality, you're keeping in step with the Spirit of God. And just as that was the case, now I don't believe that every, in every circumstance, in every situation, do we have to go and sell everything that we, um, we have and give to the poor. But, but to recognize that, yes, as Jesus looked at the man and said, look, those of you who have two coats, give to the one who has none. You know, we have to recognize that, that he's given us this, this incredible responsibility with what he has given us to help us live with open hands, to live with sensitive hearts to what is going on around us. And this early church was sensitive and they were aware of what God was up to, what God was doing. And the fourth thought that I want to share with you today is that the church um, sees Barnabas as an example. Now Barnabas is just a wonderful individual. We see him um, as an individual who just brings encouragement. And we don't know a lot about Barnabas. We, we, there are some very key passages of Scripture that tell us a bit about Barnabas and help us understand who he was and what it was that he did. But then he was nicknamed the son of encouragement. That he had just this ability to bring encouragement into the moment. That he had this ability to bring encouragement. And I want to say to you today that even as we look at this subject of the church is, is a group of people who can see the needs of those around them. We can see the needs of brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and those around them. They can see those needs. But I want to say to you how encouragement works in this circumstance is, you know, we don't and aren't able as a congregation to meet every person's need that comes to us and says there's an issue or there's a difficulty or when one of you comes to me and says to me this family is going through a difficult time or through Hard, hardship. But what I've been able to experience over the last 18 months has been just nothing short of just glorious, of, of seeing God taking the little bit that we have as a church and giving it into those circumstances and God just reminding people, encouraging people through that, that He has them, that He's going to take them through this, that He's got them in the palm of His hand. I want to say that at the beginning of lockdown, we as a church, we're given a gift by somebody in the church, a gift of 50,000 Rand that has been used over the last 18 months and is continuing to be used for the purposes of bringing this encouragement, this gift of encouragement into hearts of people who are desperate, people whose, whose situations and circumstances are difficult. And I want to say to you that when you take the time to, to hear Tanya's call, when she asks you to cook a meal for a family in need and you just say yes to her and you just say I'm going to do it I, 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 maybe I don't have the time but I can go down to spa or I can go down to checkers or I can go somewhere and get a meal a ready cooked meal so that I can deliver that to a family who are really struggling or a family who really need this help right now when you just say yes and 
that meal takes, is taken from your hands, from that family. I want to say to you that moment you're exercising encouragement into that individual or that family's life like you won't ever believe. When you just take the time to stop and you hear the Spirit of God saying to you, just that person just needs care at the moment. That person just needs a little bit of love. They need to be know, they need to know that, that they are being carried by God and by His people. And in that moment that you hear that and you feel the, the Spirit leading you to do that, that you go and you do that and you, you hand it over to them or you send that verse to them or you bring that encouragement to them, whatever that looks like, you are exercising this gift of encouragement. And you're helping that person stand. You're strengthening weak knees. And you're helping them to stand strong in the midst of trials. And you're helping them to stand strong in the midst of difficulty. This brand new church wouldn't have, wouldn't have been accepted by everybody. In actual fact, the reality is as people came to faith in Jesus Christ, they would be rejecting what they would have typically known as the faith of Israel, the faith of the Jews. And they were now taking on Jesus the Messiah, and the Messiah was rejected by um, those who put him to death. And so as a result of that, coming to faith in Jesus, if you read through the, the history books and you read through the Gospels, you suddenly realize that, that it wouldn't be welcomed by everybody. It wouldn't be welcomed by families those people were coming from. And, and in many cases, those families would drive those people out of their families. And so suddenly you had no place to belong. Suddenly you, you, were, you were not part of anything. Except you were now part of this brand new church. That you were now part of the bride of Christ. That you are now part of His holy temple. And you are being built together with all the saints into this holy temple. That you are now part of God's family. That you are now part of, and you could now call others brothers and sisters in Christ. And as, as you became that, as you, as you recognize this, you now recognize that I am part of something that God is doing. So just a moment to speak about Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira, the story of them comes soon after this particular passage. In actual fact, I think it's the very next passage. And they also go sell a field and they, but they don't do what Barnabas does. They, they lie and they say, you know, this is what they paid for it, but they keep a portion of the money back for it. Now, I don't even think for a moment there is anything wrong with selling something and then keeping a portion back of what, what you get from it. But they lie about it. They tell the people that this is their gift and they've done the same thing basically as what Barnabas has done. And this passage of Ananias and Sapphira, whilst it seems strange and it's kind of right there in this whole mix of stuff, gives us a picture of a God who hates sin. And we get a, we get a picture in this moment of, of just a couple of people who have, have lied and who are looking for accolades, but their hypocrisy leads them into something that wants them to get praise for, for what they've done, wants to, them to get acknowledgement and um, to be glorified almost in the moment. And it just reminds me in this that not only is God a God who hates sin, and, and we see in this particular instance there is retribution for that, and He brings almost immediate retribution. But that in the same breath, that in our generosity, our hearts need to be in a place where we're doing it because this is something we know God is pleased with. That we're doing this because, because not because we want to be acknowledged, not because we want to have special mention, not because we want to feel big and in charge and in control and, and almost in a, in a sense of um, uh, wanting to, to, uh, to see others acknowledge our goodness and our generosity and our, our way of doing things. But that in these moments that we give from hearts that are just overflowing with gratitude to God, for all that he has done. So my challenge is to you this morning, in the area of unity, do you see those in the body of Christ as brothers and sisters in the Lord, as mothers and as fathers, as uncles and as aunts in the Lord? 
And as a result of that, have you allowed your, your heart and, and yourself and your, to become generous? Are you living with open hands towards those? And generous hearts towards those um, that you come across. Again, this is not about you know, being irresponsible, but it is about being stewards of what God has given you and recognizing that ultimately God is the owner of all things. Are you open to God working? Are you open to Him using what you have for His honor and for His glory? And then are you open to the sensitive, um, are you open and sensitive to the work of God's Spirit? Where God is saying to you, nudging you, leading you to do something. Leading you to go and make a meal. Leading you to give something away. Leading you to be generous in some area of your life. Are you open to the Spirit of God leading you in that way? Just as Barnabas is, and this is quite an extreme case in Barnabas's case, but sometimes God leads in that way. But maybe it's just in a smaller, uh, less significant, but in a greatly significant way in God's terms um, that He's calling, you on, calling on you to do this. Or perhaps you just need to engage and recognize that that with open hands and with soft hearts, with open hands and with compassionate hearts, with open hands and generous hearts, you can have the ministry of encouragement. Where those around you are feeling the pain and feeling the difficulty and feeling the strain and, and they're going through these times of incredible difficulty, they can then feel and know that you, God has them and, and you feel encouraged and strengthened as a result um, of what you've done. Finally, I want to just share with you, um, and I know that I take the opportunity to do this almost every time I preach on this particular subject, but to remind you how you can get involved here at DBC. How you can give. Well, obviously you can give to the church and the ministries of the church, which I'm so grateful to say to all of you this morning that, and today, that God has been so good to us, and I, I trust that you continue just giving generously to DBC. But there are also other ways that you can get involved. You can get involved in the care fund where you can give something to the care fund which will then get given to somebody who's in need through either a voucher or through a financial gift. Just like those people gave 50,000 um, a year or two back, um, it doesn't have to be a large amount, it can be a small amount that you can give towards that. I also want to say to you that we have the DBC Life Trust. And right now the Life Trust is involved um, in Delft and is involved in the lives of 39 uh, retired pastors where we are giving them 800 rand a month, 39 people, 80, 89, 800 rand a month. And we've been doing that pretty much since 2008. And these are people who are retired pastors who've served the denomination as pastors and or as missionaries for years and now have very little and who are living below the bread line. And it's been awesome to be able to give to them through this time and to be able to be generous from the church to these folk um, through this time. And then the most recent project is we're getting involved with the Light of God and Baptist Church in Wallerstein. And uh, one of the ways that you can get involved is to sponsor a child. There are children that are coming to a creche on, in the mornings but there are some families who can't afford it, and so their children haven't been able to come yet because they're having to pay people to, to have them, the children there. And at 300 rand a month, you can get involved with sponsoring a child in Wallerstein and making sure that that child is also able to get an education and get the kind of training. I was out in Wallerstein the other day, and it was just beautiful to see all these little children sitting around tables and learning and growing and, and experiencing. And this learning environment where they could do this. You can get involved in crisis relief. Um, over the last two, two years, I think, as DBC, through the DBC Life Trust, we've been able to give away about 150,000 rand, if I'm not mistaken, um, in crisis relief, where we've been able to give vouchers to families who are going through really, really difficult times. Outside of our own environment, in some of the poorer communities around Cape Town, we've been able to do this and been able to give and put food on the tables of many, many people during this time. But if the Holy Spirit prompts you, I want to encourage you, just say yes. 
If the Holy Spirit prompts you, just say yes. He's not going to prompt you to be involved in every need. We are very aware that there are so many and big and massive needs all around us. But He is going to ask you to be generous and He is going to ask you to live with open hands and with soft hearts. Let's pray together as I close this time. Father, thank you so much for your spirit and the work of your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for this example in the scriptures of the new way that the disciples lived. Lord, we pray for ourselves. We ask you, Lord, that in these moments you will help us to be generous. Lord, in these moments that you would, if we're kind of grabbing hold of our stuff and we're living with tight fistedness, Lord, I pray that you would give us open hands. You would give us um, hearts that are sensitive to the work of your Spirit. Lord, thank you for this picture in the early church of, of the unity that existed, where people could see each other as family and as brothers and as sisters, and, and they could help each other in times of need. Lord, thank you, Father, for this example from Barnabas of his encouragement and his extravagant gift and his almost reckless gift, in a sense, but thank you, Lord, for the example that he is in the faith of being sensitive to what you do and what you say. Remind us, Lord, that to have hearts that are pure and hearts that are not seeking praise and seeking glory through our generosity. Not seeing and not to be seen as this big person who is able to take need, care of the needs of the others. But Lord, help us to be used in your hands and help us to be moldable and shaped by you in all things. So I thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that you continue with us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless and do continue with us now in our time of worship together.
Let this be my confession. My wealth is in the cross. My wealth is in the cross. There's nothing more I want than just to know His love. My heart is set on Christ, and I will count all else as lost. The greatest.
was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the grave. Our God has
we thank you, Father, that you are with us in this place, Lord. Thank you that you are coming soon, and Lord, we can be so excited for your kingdom and your goodness and your work, Lord. We just thank you, Father. We thank you for your love for us, Lord. Yeah, Lord, and we just know that you are with us in this place. We know that you love us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait for your coming soon. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait. so